Hey everybody, this is Sheets, and we're going to be going over UFC, I don't know what number it is, uh, whatever it is for this weekend, um, from a betting perspective. And for those of you that are here for the first time, we take a very contrarian approach to wagering, as we do with pretty much everything um, uh, wagering-based, uh, whether it be betting on sports, whether it be investing in the stock market, whether it be you know, taking a position in anything where there is any transaction cost or a big. The idea uh, behind this approach, which has been responsible for pretty much 99 of the percent of the successes in my life, is that there are two ways to approach wagering, whether it be again on any of those things. One is to believe that you can know more than the sum of the entire betting public. Um, the idea being that there's just something wrong with the line, that somebody is overvalued or undervalued or whatever. And when listen, when you're when you're dealing with a VIG where you pay 20 cents or whatever each way, you know, you, you better be better than the line, otherwise you're just gonna lose. Um, that requires an ego that I do not have. And it also it requires an ego that most of you should not have. Um, the, the statement that the line is wrong is, is such, requires such a leap of, of I don't know, of, of intellectual superiority that I think that it's, it's irresponsible to, to, to approach wagering in that way. Now, listen, if you just want to just screw around and just bet on whatever you want and you just feel that the line is whatever it is, I'm not telling you not to because I think that's, I think it's a certain degree of health in, in you know, just listen, having some action on a fight, putting some money down, you know, taking a position, having some fun with it, you know, but the purposes of this type of analysis is not just to make you, uh, you know, some profits in this week's UFC card. Um, we're not even for next week's UFC card, but just to get you to think about wagering and thinking about lines and thinking about price models in a different way. And the way I look at it, and for those of you that have been here the, the, you know, many times, I apologize having to, you have to sit through this again. Is within a line, there's, or within a price of a stock, or within a price of a prop, there is a lot that goes into that set price. And a lot of it is bias. And a lot of it is narrative. And a lot of it is just the sum of the public just piggybacking on each other to come up with an idea of what's supposed to happen. Um, and if you are on the side of that consensus, almost by definition, you're getting bad value, okay? Because the price is what it is, right? It's, there's no inherent good price out there. That's the, the assumption. And if what's going into one side of that is all kinds of narrative and kind of storytelling and stuff that's just kind of easy things to say, then I promise you that that part of it is probably overvalued. Now, does that mean it's less? Li it's not likely to win? No, I didn't say that. I'm saying that that's probably overvalued. I mean, to, again, to give the um, uh, analogy to a stock, like if you could tell me that the stock, say, uh, Oak or something like that, you tell me a stock is you know a leader in its space. It's got good profits. It's got a good product line. Even your five year old can tell you that you know that it's a good company. Probably is short, okay? Because otherwise, the price would just be higher than it is right now. Um, so that's the assumption behind kind of contrarian wagering. And it will turn you into a much, I don't want to say smarter person, but at least a much more uh, discriminating wager. Let's just put it that way. Um, and the thing that's cool about MMA with this approach is that in addition to the normal biases that go into things, MMA is very unique in that people or the wagering public settle in to a very binary outcome. In other words, not just either one fighter wins or another fighter wins. What they do is they, they, they set one way that a fighter can win. And if that doesn't happen, then this, this other thing is going to happen. The, the, the reality is that UFC is filled with, with variance and filled with chaos. And if a story of how a fight is going to go is so easy to tell, then once again, 
I promise you that's overvalued. And I promise you that's what you should be thinking. Okay? So what we're gonna be looking for uh, when we go through all this analysis is where the public is, what the easy narrative to tell is, what things we just can't bet because of that. And we're gonna just pick something different. Um, we're gonna pick something that's reasonable. That's in other words, that, that could happen, but yet for whatever reason is just is just under it's just under bet. It's just under analyzed. It's just ignored by the public. Do I think that that's likely to come in? No, but I think that those things are more likely to have value than the easy narrative uh, uh, sides. So let's just get into it. Uh, Juliana Miller versus Luana Santos. Now this is this is this actually is very very tricky because this fight is an example of people trying to get too cute. So last week, last actually last fight, you had Juliana Miller who came in as minus 400 favorite um, against uh, Victoria Hardy, I believe. And she just got obliterated, okay? And everybody used her in parlays. Everybody thought she was a lock and she was awful. And now she's going up against Luana Santos. And you would think that the public would be, would be, you know, uh, uh, I don't know, all down on Juliana Miller because of this. But what's happening is the opposite. What's happening is people are, for the first time in their lives, probably saying, "Oh, there's a lot of recency bias in this in this line." She was just minus four hundred, and now you're actually getting plus one twenty four. Oh, come on! I'm going to be smart. I'm going to take Juliana Miller. And quite honestly, that is what everybody is saying. Okay. The Luana Santos side, it's possible, right? She should be minus 200, but she's only minus 148, right? Because of that. Um, so this is an example of where the public is trying their best to be contrarian. They're trying their best to be sharp, but they're really just on tilt from losing all their money on Juliana Miller before and saying, boy, if I'm better at minus 400, I'm certainly going to better at plus 124. No, thanks. So we're going to take Luana Santos. Um, uh, we could either lay just to lay the 148. And I think that's probably the best value. Um, or we could try for a prop. But the thing is, is that there's not one settled way that this fight could end. Um, a lot of people are saying this, if Santos wins, it could be by decision. Um, but there is some steam on inside the distance. So we're just going to go with Luana Santos minus the 148 for winning. And, oh, I keep forgetting this. So here are the rules. Okay. The rules are that we are going to be betting one thing every fight. There are 13 fights. Um, again, not the best money management system in the world, but I don't care. We're also going to be betting one unit on every fight. And that for us, one unit is 10 high, 180. And we spend the same amount on every fight. Probably not the greatest money management system in the world either, but I don't care. We're doing this for fun. We're doing this as an instructive, destructive piece, okay? Uh, and the other rule is that in the last fight, in the 13th fight, the main event, we are going to bet something to get all our money back. We are going to bet something at getting at least 12 to 1, presuming that since we're being contrarian in every fight, that we probably will end up losing every other fight. So here we go. Uh, hopefully we're going to be putting all these in uh, live, but sometimes DraftKings is a little funky when it comes to having Zoom running. Well, we'll put bets in, but let's just, let's just see. Let's move on uh, to... Wait, next fight, Damon Blackshear versus um, Jose Johnson. And this was a recent addition to the card. And I'll tell you, there was just extreme line movement on this one. Um, you had Damon Blackshear, who was minus 220 basically the whole week. Excuse me, minus like 180 basically the whole week. And the last two days, it just got totally steamed to minus 265. And the reason why is you have this styles make fights argument which is <laughs> for the purposes of this fight that black sheer his entire path to victory is his wrestling excuse me and jose johnson is particularly poor at defending takedowns so as a result demond blackshear simply can't lose so all the money steams on the demond blackshear side so good enough for me We'll take Jose Johnson plus 215 for 180.
And at the end, we're just going to put stake all singles. All right, moving on. Jacqueline Amarine versus Montserrat Ruiz. So this one, you have, this is another thing that happens quite a bit. Jacqueline Amarine in her last fight, she was a big favorite over Shan Hughes. And she came in in the first round and threatened a submission um, on several occasions and was unable to get it. And then she ended up running out of gas and Sam Hughes came in as a big underdog and dominated her in the second and third round. So you would think that people would be down on her for this next fight. But what people are saying is that they're, they're just relying on that first round and say, well, boy, oh boy, she was so close to getting that submission in the first round that this is what's going to happen uh, in this next fight against Montserrat Ruiz. Now, in addition to that, you have this very particular style argument here. You have Montserrat Ruiz, whose her one move is basically this 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 um, kind of headlock uh, judo throw sort of. And what you're hearing all throughout the industry is this: when she does that, it's going to give Jacqueline Amory the opportunity to take her back and get that submission. So there's basically no way to avoid Amorim getting a submission in the first round. Um, this is MMA, right? This is chaos. The idea that that's the only thing that could happen is is nonsense. Um, now, is that could that happen? Sure, but whatever the price is on that is just terrible. So you can't bet Amorim by sub. You can't certainly can't bet her by sub in the first round. Okay. The only thing you can really do here is you could play uh, Ruiz, or if you want, you could play Amarim by decision. And what's cool about Amarim by decision is that it fights the narrative of her bad cardio. You're, you're, you know, you're seeing that, well, she gasses after the first round. So playing Amarim by, by decision is probably the most ignored piece of this. Um, I wonder what the price is on this. Um, Amarim by decision plus 450. Let's go. We will take that all day. All right. Uh, moving on, we have Josh Parisian versus Martin Budai. Um, so Martin Budai is, you know, there's a pretty clear narrative here that he's going to basically just, you know, out volume Josh Parisian maybe clinch, uh, maybe win a clinch battle up against the fence or something like that. Um, uh, um, the only real value here is probably playing Parisian or maybe Boudet a knockout in the first round because the idea that Boudet kind of wins this boring decision is probably the, the, the part of this which is bet the most. So you could either play Parisian by decision or Budai, or we don't even need Parisian by decision. You can just play Parisian or Budai early. So let's take a look at some of these lines here. What what is Budai inside the distance? That would be that would be a fun way to play. Um, I don't want to play either of these. Oh boy, Budai by submission plus nine hundred. Boy, that would be really sexy if we get that one home. But let's just see. Um, Let's see winning method. Budai by inside the distance plus no, not plus plus one seventy five. Um, yeah, that looks reasonable. So it's either that or Parisian straight up. Parisian by submission plus sixteen hundred. Now we're gonna we're gonna bet Budai inside the distance. Plus 175. Certainly not Budai winning by decision. Okay. Um, that's gonna be the one that's priced in. We're just gonna bet him inside the distance. So Martin Budai plus 175 for win. All right, Francis Marshall versus Isaac uh uh Bulgarian. So this one is a freaking war. You know, you have Bulgarian with all of this wrestling upside. He has, he's won eight fights, lost zero. He's not been out of the first round, but it's not as though everybody's picking him. Like Francis Marshall, that people are picking him as well. 
because he is, you know, he's got the better level of competition, things like that. The one thing that people are not betting is this fight to be sort of boring, okay? Um, so what we're going to be doing is we are going to, to fight that narrative. We're going to bet for a boring fight. So we're going to bet this to go to decision. So Marshall Dolgarian, fight lines, uh, where's the fight props? Fight to go the distance, 165 plus 180. All right, moving on. Terrence McKinney versus Mike Breeden. So this one, to me, is the easiest bet on the card. Well, it's the easiest analysis on the card because people are 100% sure of what is going to happen. So Terrence McKinney, this is the narrative, has two and a half minutes of cardio or three minutes of cardio. He's also only on three weeks rest. So he's going to be going after it, and especially in a minus 270 favor or whatever, he is probably going to get Breeden out of there in the first round. And if he does not get him out of there in the first round, then Breeden will take over and win. So what you cannot bet is Breeden late, and you cannot bet McKinney early. Okay. So what you can bet, though, is McKinney in round two. So that is what we're going to do. Uh, fight lines. Let's see. Uh, round props. McKinney round two plus 650. Let's go. Moving on, we have JP Buys versus Marcus McGee. Um, I mean, what can you say? A Marcus McGee is coming off of a big second round KO uh, or submission, uh, coming off of short notice against J.P. Buys, who is coming off of, you know, some, some uh, several straight losses here. And Marcus Biggie is probably going to knock him out in the first or second round. So because of that analysis, those are the bets you probably cannot make. You can't bet McGee first round. You can't bet him second round. So the only thing you really do is you could play either Bays or, or McGee late or by decision. So why don't we see – which is which is greater, McGee round? Well, McGee round three is going to be the, the the most expensive. I promise you that. I mean the, the 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 biggest price. But I wonder what McGee by decision as opposed to to buys, just straight up is. Let's take a look at some of these. Um, Marcus McGee round props. McGee round three plus 900 degree round two plus 400 that's very reasonable yeah i mean people are playing mcgee round one mcgee round mcgee round two is the same as mcgee by decision boy oh boy well we'll play mcgee round two mcgee round two for 180 Josh Fremd versus Jamie Pickett. So Jamie Pickett is awful. He's just awful. Uh, uh, he just can't beat anybody decent. And this is basically a, a an easy matchup for Fremd. Fremd is going to probably get him out of the, or, you know, the first or second round, probably by submission. So essentially what you can't bet is Fremd, Fremd early, Fremd by submission. Um, the only thing you could bet here and be contrarian, you could bet Pickett, or you can bet Frem by decision. Um, so let's take a look at those two lines and see what we have. So Pickett himself is plus 280. Um, or let's see, Frem by decision is plus 240. So it's pretty much the same. Um, yeah, this is gonna be pretty contrarian as it is. Let's take Frem by decision. Plus 240. All right. Um, moving on, we have uh, AJ Dobson versus Tefan and Chikwi. Um, So AJ Dobson is getting just the most steam in the in the uh, in the analysis and not picking up 
any steam in the betting market. Okay. So for, for this type of price, you know, like he's plus 124 and, and Chukri is minus 148. For a plus 124 uh, underdog, you're getting probably like 10 to 1 uh, uh, picks on Dobson based on the analysis. You have him getting uh, being more athletic, being a better wrestler, or, or all this. And yet still, and Jukwi, you have him as the favorite. So uh, something's got to be weird here. So I'm just going to take the, the terrible pick going against all this athleticism and wrestling stuff. And just take in Chukwe minus the 148. Um, I don't know anybody who's doing this. Um, Dobson is just like the big sharp play of the year. I, I just we just have to be on the other side. All right. Um, so again, as you're noticing, it's not just about playing underdogs to be contrary. You know, you just have to be on the other side of, of the of the of the narrative. All right, um, Pollyanna Viana versus Yasmin Lucindo. Um, I'm getting a little bit of both sides here. I'm, I'm getting that Pollyanna Viana, she has submission upside. I mean, she goes for that arm bar quite a bit. It reminds me of the Julia Stolyarenko play when she was against uh, Molly McCann, that that's what she's going to go for. That's really all Lucindo would have to stop. So what that means is that what's probably unplayable, believe it or not, is is Pollyanna Vienna by submission. Because um, that is agreed upon as her one path to victory. So I imagine that that line is probably overvalued. So the only thing you could really play on the Vienna side is maybe Vienna by decision. Um, and on the Lucindo side, people are just saying that she's just going to basically keep Vienna at range minor P's and Q's and win a decision. So if you want to play Lucindo, you can play her inside the distance. So let's take a look and see what some of these odds are. These are really all that we're going to choose from. Either Lucinda inside the distance or Molly or, or Viana probably by decision. We're probably just going to take Lucindo inside the distance. Let's take a look at this. Lucindo winning method uh, inside the distance plus 300. That's pretty healthy. But that is pretty healthy. Vienna by decision plus 600. Could she possibly pull that off? How funny is this? By submission plus 320. Or just Lucindo beats her up, finishes her inside the distance. Boy, this is a real close one. And when it's a real close, and we're just gonna we're just gonna take the biggest price. So we're gonna take Viana by decision plus six. All right. Um. All right. Moving on, we have, and that has no chance to win. By the way, this is why we we're gonna have a thirteen to one shot in the last uh, fight. By the way. Khalil Roundtree versus Chris Dawkins. Um. This is sneaky. You know, like if you asked me at the beginning of the week, it was it was all Roundtree. You know, he was going to just beat the brakes off of Dawkins. Dawkins, every time he fought like a big striker like Rosenstruck or 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 Derek Lewis and Curtis Blades just got starched. But Dawkins has been taking some really sneaky money um, during the course of the week. Um, so in a weird way, betting either of these fighters is not, you're really not, fading either of them in other words you're getting probably some equal equal play on each side but what you are getting but what you are seeing is that roundtree his path to victory is apparently going to be early where Dawkus people are making cases for either like he can get an early finish or maybe he can win a decision so the only thing that people are ignoring is what we are going to bet and that is going to be roundtree late so it's either going to be round tree by decision or maybe round tree round two or three. So let's take a look at what some of these some of these uh, odds are. All right, we have round props. Round tree round two plus four fifty. That's pretty good, but boy, round tree by decision plus nine hundred. 
that is so sweet if we can get that done. What about round tree and round three plus 1200? What does that look like? It just looks like, you know, a fight where round tree just finally gets there. Boy, oh boy. It's close, but it's definitely between those two. I think the round tree by decision is the one that has that, boy, oh boy. Sound of that. We're going to take the big, again, when we're, when, we're, when we're between them, we're going to take the bigger price. Round tree, round three for one. All right, two more. We have Cub Swanson versus Hakeem Duwato. This is this is easy. You have, you know, Cub Swanson is literally on the way out. Everybody wants to root for him, but he really doesn't have much left. Um, Duwato is just probably going to win, but it's probably not going to finish him. It's going to be some Duwato by decision situation. So that's what you can't bet. You can either bet Swanson by himself or Duwato inside the distance. So let's take a look at this. So we're going to bet whichever one is 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 a bigger price. So if we want Swanson. He's plus one eighty five. Let's take a look and see what uh, Duwato inside the distance is. Duwato inside the distance is plus one forty. So we're just going to take Swanson by himself. Swanson plus one eighty five for what? All right, so let's review these atrocious bets that we made before we get the, all our money back in the, in the main event. Um, Juliana Miller, um, <clears throat> obviously, this is an overreaction as far as the line goes. No way Santa should be minus 148, so we're betting. Uh, Demond Blasher has an incredible style edge over Jose Johnson, um, so we're going to take Jose Johnson. Um, Amarim is certainly going to get that first round submission over uh, Ruiz. Um, if that happens, we're going to lose because we have her to win by decision, plus 450. Uh, Boudet is definitely going to just, you know, get a slow, boring decision against the fence. Um, so we're going to lose our plus 175 inside the distance bet. Francis Marshall, Isaac Duguerin is going to be a war and it's probably going to finish in the first round or two. If that case, we lose because we have it going to distance, plus 165. Terrence McKinney, if he doesn't get him out of the first round, he has no chance to win. So our round two plus 650 is going to lose. Marcus McGee, round one, is probably when he's going to get this win. Get this win. So our round two probably is a little weak. So plus 400, that's down the toilet. Josh Frem certainly is going to take Pickett to the woodshed here. Um, you know, Pickett just gets finished by anybody that's, any, that's decent. So the fact that he can even go to a decision is ridiculous. But we're going to try it, plus 240. Um, A.J. Dobson, more athletic, better wrestler, and has had some tough fights recently. Why on earth would Nichukwi be favored 148? Well, I don't know, but we're going to try it, minus 148. Pollyanna Vianna, her one path to victory is going to be by submission. And when that happens, we're going to be going rats, because we have her by decision, plus 600. Khalil Roundtree, Dawkus, it's going to be a war. And... Khalil Roundtree, if the good Khalil Roundtree shows up, he knocks him out in the first round. If not, Dawkins probably wins. What can't happen is what we bet. Khalil Roundtree, round three, plus 1,200. Uh, Cub Swanson, retirement fight, on his way out, can't win. Plus 185, good enough for us. So now that we're going to be 0-12, let's take a look at the main event. We have Vincente Luque versus Rafael Dos Anjos. Oh, I know what I'm going to do this 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 uh, this fight. I just know it because this is a very easy fight to break down, just like coat is a very easy stock to analyze. Rafael dos Anjos is going to be going for takedowns, and if he gets them, he's going to win either by submission or in or by decision, right? It's Vincente Luque, okay? If he can stuff the takedowns, he's younger, he's got more volume, and he's going to win either by decision or by KO. So if you've been following along, what can you not bet? You can't bet 
Dos Anjos by decision. You can't bet Dos Anjos by, um, by uh, submission. And you can't bet Luque by uh, KO or by decision. So what do you have left here? Well, that's where we're going to be choosing from. So what you can either do is just try to get lucky and pick your pick a good round, or what we're going to do is we're going to play either Luque by submission or Dos Anjos by KO. So let's take a look and see what some of these lines are. And if you don't get 12 to 1, we're going to have to go for the particular round, and then you'll end up getting 30 to 1. Let's take a look at some of these. Luque by submission is only plus 450. Very, very troubling. And you have Dos Anjos by KO is only plus 650. So unfortunately, these are not going to work. So we're going to have to pick a specific round. Ouch. So let's take a look. Round props. Um, we have Luque round four. That's, that's good enough. You have Dos Anjos round four. So anything in round four or five, as far as a finish go, is going to be good enough. And the question is, who is more likely for that to work in, in, in its favor? And we have to fade that because that's probably going to be the most likely, you know, most overvalued piece. So if anybody's going to get a finish late, it's probably going to be Dos Anjos. So we're going to pick Luque. We're going to go Vincente Luque, round four, plus 1,400 for one. <laughs> Best of luck to everybody. Sorry that everybody's going to be losing their 13 units this this uh, this card, but hopefully at least you learned something about how to approach these types of things. Um, let's see if we can bet them right now. Nah, it's not going to let me. But once I log off and on, uh, I will be able to. Good luck, everyone.